Okay, moving on to a new topic, complex fractions. And you're like, what's a complex fraction? Well, a complex fraction is basically a fraction over a fraction. See in the numerator? It's a fraction. See in the denominator? It's a fraction. That's a complex fraction. By the way, the only thing required to be a complex fraction is either the numerator or the denominator has a fraction. They don't both have to have fractions, but most of the time, numerator and denominator both have their own fractions. So check out problem number one here. That's a complex fraction. I have a fraction over a fraction. And you're like, well, how do I handle that? Glad you asked. Here's what you have to remember. You have to actually remember what this line separating the numerator and denominator actually means. Give you a hint. It means an operation. Does it mean to add, subtract, multiply, or divide? Which one does it actually mean for you to do? Good. This line separating numerator and denominator tells you that this is a division problem, which means I have 10 over 3x divided by 5 over 6x. Remember how to multiply? Or, pardon me, do you remember how to divide fractions? Yeah, you multiply, don't you? You multiply by the reciprocal, don't you? Yeah, fraction number 2 gets flipped over and it becomes a multiplication problem, doesn't it? And you're like, okay, can you tell me why that actually happens? I'm sidetracking you. Understand that, I'm sidetracking you. Here's the deal. In this complex fraction, if this denominator wasn't a fraction, it'd be much easier to deal with, right? So if I could get rid of this denominator, if I could cancel it and make it a 1, that would be super, right? So if I take 5 over 6x and multiply by its reciprocal, doesn't this all cancel? Yeah, which means whatever you do to the denominator, you must do to the numerator, don't you? Remember our original division problem? Remember how we were taught to handle this when we were yay high? Yeah, they told us leave fraction number one alone, change it to a multiplication problem, and flip fraction number two. See that? It's exactly the same as this. This is why you always end up multiplying by the reciprocal of fraction two because fraction 2 was the denominator, which we were trying to get rid of in this wonderful complex fraction. That's why division turns to multiplication, because all of these division problems with fractions were originally complex fractions. Good? Okay. And now what do we do? Yeah, if possible, we're going to do some reducing first, some canceling first, and if I can do that, that'll make life a little bit easier so I can multiply straight across. So gratefully, the 5 and the 10 cancel, the x's cancel, and the 3 and the 6 cancel, right? Which leaves me in the numerator a 2 times 2 and on the bottom just a 1. So my final answer here is a 4. Agreed? Awesome. Look at problem number 2. Is that a complex fraction? Certainly is. What does this line mean separating numerator and denominator? It means divide, so here's the thing. We're going to have to divide. So that means I have x plus 3 over 12, and I'm dividing it by 4x minus 5 over 15. How do you divide fractions? Yep, it turns to be a multiplication problem, doesn't it? just like I showed you over here. So, we understand why fraction number one doesn't change because that was the one in the numerator. It gets multiplied by the reciprocal of fraction two because now we understand that fraction two was the one in the denominator and we had to multiply by its reciprocal to get rid of it from the denominator. Okay, so here we are. Anything? 
Yeah, let's do some canceling. I see it too. The 12 can be reduced by 3, and so can't the 15. So the 12 becomes a 4, and the 15 becomes a 5. Good. So, let's see. We end up with 5 times the quantity of x plus 3 in the numerator. Yes? And the denominator, we end up with a 4 times a 4x minus 5. Anything else I can cancel? Nope. So ask your instructor. Leave it this way or distribute. Watch the online homework program if you're using one of those because some of them will want you to simplify it, which means it doesn't want any parentheses in the final answer. So this could be your final answer or this one. More than likely, it's probably this bottom one. Cool? Hang in there. Got enough. So let's look at this third problem. It's a complex fraction because I do have a fraction in the numerator and a fraction in the denominator, right? Well, here's the deal though. In the numerator, I've got an addition problem, and in the denominator, I have a subtraction problem, don't I? So you're like, well, how am I supposed to think about this, okay? This is two pieces. I have the numerator and I have the denominator to deal with, right? I really don't know what the numerator looks like because of this addition problem. If I could combine these two fractions together, then I could have a single fraction in the numerator, and that would be simpler to deal with, wouldn't it? And in the denominator, same thing. If I could combine that to a single fraction, that would be a lot easier to deal with, wouldn't it? Okay, so this is how you tackle these complex fractions. I'm going to have to combine the fraction in the numerator and then combine them in the denominator and then move forward. So, this is like a three-piece puzzle. Numerator, denominator, and then lastly, I finally actually get to divide them. So, let's look at the numerator first. I am going to have to take 2 over x squared and add it to 1 over x. So, I'm hoping you remember how to find common denominators. If you don't, go back and look at that lecture video on adding and subtracting rational expressions. Okay, here, my common denominator is x squared. Good. First fraction, that's good. It's already an x squared, so there's a 2 there. Fraction number 2, however, needs to get multiplied by another x to make its denominator an x squared. So this is an x here on fraction number 2. So the numerator, when I add these two fractions, I get 2 plus x over x squared. Good? Okay. So this now becomes 2 plus x over, sorry, I decided I was going to move this. So the numerator actually looks like 2 plus x over x squared. And now i got to figure out what the denominator looks like. So here is for our denominator. And I have to take 4 over x squared and minus 1 over x. Need a common denominator, don't we? Okay, so I'm seeing x squared as the common denominator. The first numerator isn't going to change because its denominator was already x squared. However, denominator number 2 needed to get multiplied by an x, which means so did the numerator, which means this is an x. Which means the denominator, when I combine the two fractions, looks like this. Aha! Now that looks like something that we dealt with in problems number one and two, right? Okay, so this is a division problem, good. Which means the real problem I'm working on looks like this, right? And how do you divide fractions? Yeah, fraction number one stays the same. Fraction number two up, 
before I get to fraction number two, division turns to multiplication and fraction number two flips. And I'm noticing that those x squareds are going to cancel. Question, can you cancel the two and the four? Or the x and the x? Good, you cannot. Because that addition has two and the x super glued together, you ain't pulling them apart. And this minus sign has the four and the x super glued together, you ain't pulling them apart. Which means I end up with two plus x over four minus x. Good? Awesome. Hang in there. Got another one. Let's look at this fourth problem. Do you notice in the numerator? Again, I have two fractions up there. In this case, I'm supposed to subtract the two fractions. And in the denominator, same thing, two fractions, but I need to subtract them. So it looks like problem number three, doesn't it? Yeah. So we need to kind of simplify the numerator and then simplify the denominator, and then we can see what fractions we're really supposed to be dividing. So, let's look. The numerator goes first. Why? Because it's on the top. I have this subtraction problem. By the way, I'm noticing that the second denominator here is not in descending order, so I'm going to put it in descending order. So what comes first, the 4 or this x? Yeah, this x, but this x has a minus sign in front of it. So technically it's a negative x and a positive 4, isn't it? Okay, and now I need a common denominator, and you're like, hmm. Do you notice? These x's are the opposite sign, and so are those 4's, right? Okay, just watch a second. If I... Just watch, don't write, just watch. On the second denominator, I'm going to factor out a negative 1. And you're like, why are you going to do that? Watch what happens. A negative x divided by a negative 1. Positive x. Positive 4 divided by a negative 1. Negative 4. Do you notice the denominators are the same? The only difference is this second one has a negative 1. I don't want that negative 1 there. So, if I multiply this negative 1 by another negative 1, wouldn't it basically cancel these two out and make it a positive 1? Yep. And no, it's not arbitrary. We're being very purposeful in that. I noticed that these two signs were the exact opposite of these two signs. And since the first term is negative, I'm factoring out a negative. And the only negative I could factor out was a negative 1. And when I did that, now this denominator looked like this one, except for the negative 1 hanging out front. So I'm going to multiply the denominator and the numerator by a negative 1, which means we have 3 over x minus 4 minus this negative 2, right? What happens there? It's a double negative. That's going to make this a po an addition problem. And this numerator is actually just 5 over x minus 4. Cool? Okay. Yeah. This one was actually a lot easier than it looked. Even though this denominator looked the ex was flipped of this one. And you're like, they look almost alike, but that's the deal. That's how you handle those denominators. So the numerator is 5 over x minus 4. And now we get to figure out the denominator. So the denominator is the subtraction of these two fractions. And it looks like my common denominator would be x minus 4 times that x, wouldn't it? Okay. So... What do we have to do to fraction 1? Multiply by an x on top and bottom. So this is a 2x minus. What do we have to do to fraction 2? Yeah, multiply by x minus 4, top and bottom. So that's going to be a 2x minus 8, isn't it? Right? Okay. Remember why the parentheses are there? Yeah, because it's following a subtraction sign. You always want to put a parenthesis right after a subtraction sign and 
so you remember to distribute the minus sign to both of these. So, 2x minus 2x plus 8, agreed? Which means it's going to be 8 over this common denominator. This is my answer for the denominator. Agreed? Okay, if you need to, pause this video, rewind it, make sure you understand how we combine the numerator together and how we combine the denominator together because this is the, this is the problem I'm really supposed to be working on. This is my real complex fraction. They were hiding it with all this stuff. And now I know what I'm supposed to do. I am supposed to take the 5 over x minus 4 and I'm supposed to divide it by the 8 over x times the parentheses of x minus 4. But remember how you divide fractions. Yep, fraction number 1 stays the same. Division becomes a multiplication problem and fraction number 2 does a flip. And I'm going to try to cancel. Gratefully I can cancel here, can't I? And when I do, x minus 4's drop, which leaves me 5x on the top and an 8 on the bottom. And there is my final answer. Agreed? Cool. Hang in there. Got enough. Let's look at problem 4. Do you notice the numerator is already a single fraction? Nothing to do there. Yay for that. But the denominator has two fractions in it, doesn't it? Okay, so it looks like we have to work on the denominator only in this case before we can actually tackle the complex fraction. So I have to figure out what 1 plus 1 over x minus 3 actually simplifies to. So it looks like the common denominator is x minus 3. Agreed? The second fraction is already good, so the numerator is just going to stay a 1. Remember, fraction 1 is technically 1 over 1, so I am going to multiply top and bottom by x minus 3, which means there's the numerator on fraction 1, and when I add these two, I'm going to get x minus 2 over x minus 3. Cool? Alright, so... This complex fraction really looks like x minus 2 over x squared minus 9, and that is being divided by, right, x minus 2 over x minus 3. Cool? Okay, so this is, remember, technically a division problem, so I'm going to write it as a division problem because we're very used to that. It'll make life a little bit simpler for us to write it out in this format since that's what we're very used to. And remember, fraction 1 stays the same and then division turns to multiplication and fraction 2 does a flip on you, doesn't it? And then we get to cancel, right? However, I see denominator number 1 and I'm like, wait a minute, I think that one can be factored. And if you're thinking that, you're correct. It can. So pause the video, you go factor it, start the video again, and let's see if we agree. Okay, you factored it. Then here's what I got on that denominator when I factored it. Did you? Cool. And x minus 3 over the x minus 2. Okay. So here comes the fun, as I always call it, because I love to do this canceling. So there goes the x minus 2's, there go the x minus 3's. Yay! And so what's your answer? Yep, I heard you guys. You're like, x plus 3 is my answer. And I would mark it wrong. You're like, wait, what? Why? I agree there's an x plus 3 left. But where is it located? It's located in the denominator, which means in your answer, the x plus 3 is supposed to be in the denominator. What's in the numerator? You're like, I don't know. 
How many times does x minus 2 go into itself? Once. How many times does x minus 3 go into itself? Once. What's 1 times 1? 1. That's your final answer. Be very cautious about going, oh, my answer is x plus 3. But the x plus 3 was in the denominator. Cool? Okay. I got one more for us. Kind of a bonus problem. Be right back. Okay. Here's that bonus problem. Why? <laughs> do, you, do you see those negative exponents? And you're like, okay, can we skip it? And the answer is no. So here's the deal. Those negative exponents aren't so bad. What you have to remember is what do they mean? So for instance, let's just look at the first one. We have 2a to the negative 1. Here's what you need to remember about negative exponents. What you need to remember is this. When you have a negative exponent, it tells you that what it is sitting on is in the wrong location. For instance, does a 2 have a negative exponent? No. So I'm just going to write the 2. But the a is to a negative 1 power, which means at the wrong place. It shouldn't be sitting next to the 2. It should be sitting under the 2. Like, oh, wait a minute. Yep. Negative exponents tell you that this, in this case, this a is in the wrong place. It doesn't belong next to the 2. It belongs under the 2, which means this problem in reality should be written as 2 over a plus 3 over b squared. With me? That's in the numerator. You're like, okay. This problem is now looking familiar. Of course it's looking familiar. It's looking like the last few problems we've done. But wait, we're not done with the denominator. You're like, yeah, but what's the a sitting next to? Well, what's the coefficient of that a even though you don't see it? Good. That's a 1. And what's the coefficient of that b? Also a 1, which means it's 1 over a minus 1 over b. Cool. That's the bonus problem. You had to remember that the negative exponents told you that that variable, because that's what the negative exponent was sitting on, didn't belong next to the 2. It belonged under it. So let's see if you follow along. All right. I am just going to work out the problem, pause it, see what you get when you add these two guys together. And then start the video again and see if we agree. You back? Okay, so let's see. I had to multiply by b squared and this by a. So I have 2b squared plus 3a over the common denominator of ab squared. That's my numerator. In the denominator, that had to get multiplied by b and this one by a, which means I have b minus a over ab. Do we agree? Excellent. Okay. So, this is really a division problem, right? 2b squared plus 3a over ab squared is being divided by b minus a over ab. And how do you divide fractions? Good. Fraction 1 stays the same. Division turns to multiplication and fraction 2 does a flip, doesn't it? And I don't know about you, but here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing this a and this a canceling. This b cancels, which leaves me a b down here. And I don't see a whole lot else canceling, do I? Well, that's a bummer. But if that's the way it goes, that's the way it goes. So we have 2b squared plus 3a on the top. And on the bottom, we have b times b minus a. And if you're supposed to multiply those together, because that's what the directions say to do, then multiply them together. Cool? Okay. Hopefully, handling these complex fractions makes sense to you. It's basically adding and subtracting fractions first, isn't it? 
Not always. Problems one and two, we didn't have to do that. But problems three, four, and five, we sure did. So you have fun with complex fractions, and I'll catch you on.